God grant me the words to speak his thoughts. I'd like to uh, thank Matt Glavin and the Georgia Public Policy Foundation for inviting me here. I would hope that all of us will remember the historic nature of today here in Atlanta, Georgia, where on next Tuesday the citizens of this state will make a very decisive decision. I am moved to call it already a historic decision because depending on who wins, it's definitely going to determine the outcome of this presidential nominating process. And more is at stake than the citizens of Georgia, and more is at stake than which man will represent his respective party. We in America, ladies and gentlemen, are at a crossroads, like at no time that I know of. <coughs> we saw our president three or four weeks ago go to Japan with the captains of capitalism from Detroit and ask the Japanese for affirmative action, quotas, and guaranteed outcomes. Sound familiar? <laughs> desperate people do desperate things. It sounds like the black community 30 or 40 years ago. The black community made up its mind that it was going to change its status with affirmative action quotas and guaranteed outcomes from whites. It didn't happen and it never will happen. America will never be economically competitive depending on Japan and black people will never be economically competitive depending on white people. In order to be economically competitive, you must do two things. You must sacrifice and you must change. The reason that Germany and Japan won World War II is because Germany and Japan lost militarily World War II. And when you lose, you change. When you're lying on your back on the floor, anything you see when you look, look up looks good. <laughs> I remember seeing an interview with uh, Mr. Morito, the chairman of the board of Sony, in 1985. I was in a hotel in Cleveland and they asked him how he pulled off this phenomenal marvel of creating this phenomenal com com manufacturing company. He said, after World War II, remember when we all, we Americans used to buy made in Japan items to laugh at the dolls, their eyes crossed and the arms fell off, the baseball gloves came apart before you caught the ball. Oh, we had a, we had a great time, didn't we, buying Japanese products to laugh at them. Made in Japan, ha, ha, ha. We really believed in America that all we had to do was put Made in USA on something and there was something magical about Americans. That we knew something no one else in the world knew. That all we had to do was to get out and practice what we call free market economics and people naturally would buy it if it had America on it. Well, people do that to some extent now when they buy Chryslers or Dodges, but they're made in Tokyo. <laughs> the bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, is Mr. Morito said he was so offended as a Japanese that people throughout the world were making fun of his culture, that he was determined to create a company that would be the best in the world run by Japanese. Sony and the Japanese miracle, ladies and gentlemen, came out of, came out of the pride that Japanese have in being Japanese. In America, we've lost it. What are we doing in America now? We are trying to win various wars. Blacks want to be victorious, whites want to be victorious, women want to be victorious, men want to remain in power, northerners want to dominate southerners, southerners want to dominate northerners. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's, a, it's nothing but a game of madness. There will be no victors in this society. White people cannot defeat black people. And black people cannot defeat white people. We cannot have a country in which we put Jews or homosexuals or any other group of people aside, no matter what you think of them. We are here to stay. You may not like me and I may not particularly care for you, but you and I better get one thing straight. We're all we've got. country has lost its way. 72% of Americans in polls understand that. They know America has lost its vision. A week ago, six days ago, the Detroit News and Gannett News Service did the most extensive, exhaustive national, nationwide polling of blacks I've ever, that anyone in my memory has ever done. They found out that blacks overwhelmingly, in the 80s and the 90s percentiles, 
felt that the civil rights movement was going in the wrong direction, they weren't paying attention to the things that were important, and have very little faith in black national leaders. So here we have Americans in general understanding that we are going, we are adrift, and black Americans understanding that the black community is adrift, and what do we do? These are the times, ladies and gentlemen, when someone can come along and truly appeal to your darker side. Now keep in mind, I'm going to ask you here today to do two things. I'm going to ask you to change, and I'm going to ask you to sacrifice. And in that context, I'm going to ask you to pay particular attention to the demagogues who come along during troubled times. Now, I know you want a scapegoat. We all do, because we really want to understand what happened to us. And it's simple for the Pat Buchanans, who, when they go to New Hampshire, talk to the white people there about economics, but when they come to Georgia and the South, they talk to you about racism and quotas and pornography and all kinds of other things that they feel will appeal to that inner dark side in Southern whites that will remind you of the bad old days when you had out and out overt segregation. You can't go back to those days. Those days didn't work and we will never ever again in America return to the past. There will be no returning to America first. Remember a man named Adolf Hitler who had another slogan, Deutschland über alles. That's translated as America First in German. America First was the movement in 1939, early 40s, uh, of the isolationist whites in this country who basically agreed and sympathized with Nazi Germany. They did not want America involved in the war because they really wanted Germany to, to defeat Europe. It's the same thing. Nobody's going to pull a curtain around this country or, or dig a ditch between the United States and Mexico and solve our problems. Now, you don't believe that. Do you really believe if you're white that your problem is black people? Young man last night on West Mentor's show called in from, uh, forget where he was, uh, somewhere in Georgia, and said he was 20 years old. He was worried about reverse discrimination, about black people taking his job. Black people didn't take his job. His job has been exported, ladies and gentlemen, because we've lost our ability to compete. Our labor is too expensive. Our management is, is, is ineffective. That's where his job went. But Buchanan will make it seem real simple. If you just keep your eye on Tony Brown and those black people who want all these funny programs, you'll get a job. He will not get a job, and he'll never get the job his father and his uncle had. They are not here anymore. And they're not here because our country is not competitive. And it is not competitive because it will not save. Our citizens will not save. We will not reinvest in research and development. And we continually re-elect people to run our government who are robbing us blind and playing blacks against back to slavery, 4% of white people in America owned slaves, but they were so devious and clever that they could co convince 100% of the poor whites that they were better off being unemployed while they brought in free labor from Africa and put them in, in, in mud huts. They ran the same game during slavery. The same thing is going on now. Blacks and whites are at each other's throats. Number one, neither of us can win. That's number one. Nobody's going anywhere. Blacks cannot live in this country and dominate whites. That's mathematically impossible. And whites cannot live in a country that's going to be all white, in spite of what Pat Buchanan says. This is a white man's country. It's not a white man's country. It's the country of everybody who's an American, no matter what they are and no matter what they believe in. We may not like that, but that's the reality of it. So we're going to have to do one of two things. We're going to have to go to our darker side and follow the Pat Buchanan's. Or are we going to have to say, what do we want? This man is not giving us a vision. He's giving us a nightmare. Hitler gave that to the Germans, and Germany is still paying for the mistake. Hitler didn't like immigrants. Buchanan doesn't like immigrants. Hitler didn't thought that there was something wrong with Jews. Buchanan has never seen a Nazi that's been charged with a crime that wasn't innocent. Buchanan believes that there's something psychologically wrong with women. They can't fit into the workplace. He believes that blacks are Zulus who cannot adapt to America, who cannot be assimilated. This Zulu adapted to America. This Zulu assimilated. I went from poverty to wealth and a very good education, and I did it because of the fact that I am an African. Ladies and gentlemen, we are not going anywhere attempting to play this game of division. And black America, ladies and gentlemen, is completely deluded. Black America believes somehow that the black middle class can get together every summer at 350 conventions, spend $16 billion in white hotels, call white people all kinds of names, and then somehow our problems will be solved. We do it every summer. We spend $16 billion, which is equal to America's 
uh, the, the, uh, the America's budget for uh, foreign aid and military assistance. That's how much money blacks spend each summer in hotels owned by whites, calling white people names and blaming them for racism. And then every September, the black middle class goes to what's called the Congressional Black Raucous Legislative Weekend. In Washington, D.C., the black middle class in five days spends one half billion dollars, one hundred million dollars a day for five days, five hundred million dollars at the Hilton Hotel. Uh, we come at, at midnight to the fashion show, which is the best attended thing there. We're sitting at ten thousand dollar tables eating buffalo wings, drinking scotch whiskey, and doing the electric slide. <laughs> and the speaker gets up and does an obligatory two-hour uh, dissertation on how terrible the Republican Party, conservatives, and Ronald Reagan are, and why they won't help us. And we then plan next year's meeting. <laughs> and we do it every year. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please, please understand this. I am not belittling the effect that racism has on people. Racism is debilitating. Believe me, it is a terrible thing to be under the yoke of racism. But ladies and gentlemen, racism doesn't define the black experience. And Japan doesn't define the American experience. We define our own experiences based on the way we see ourselves. And if you do not see yourself as someone who can compete, you cannot compete. I don't care who likes me or who doesn't like me. That's not going to stop me from having what I want. What I want is going to depend on what I am willing to sacrifice how much I'm willing to sacrifice, and how much I'm willing to change. I love Patrick Buchanan, and I love David Duke, in spite of their proclivities that are not of the nicest side of a human being. But I love them. I love them because I have overcome what they're doing. And because I am free of what they're doing, I am free to do and pursue that which is right. And that's the sacrifice I'm talking about. It is not true that Rome and the, and, and the great civilizations failed because of an external force they fail, ladies and gentlemen, because they, they, they fell apart from within. They lost civic virtue. That's when Caligula voted his horse into the Senate. And when you lose civic virtue, the ability to sacrifice for the good of the group, you lose your social fiber. And we in America, black and white, are going to have to understand that both of us are wrong. And we're going to have to, to do something about it. You're not going to stop people from being poor and wanting help. But you have to understand how to develop policies. Now, we have an idea or a policy in America called affirmative action, which many demagogues have made people believe is essentially reverse discrimination. First of all, under Title VII, all discrimination is illegal. So you don't have to have reverse illegality. Reverse discrimination is a nonsensical term. If you discriminate against anyone, it is against the law. So there's no such thing as reverse discrimination. That's just another code word. So you aren't supposed to discriminate. Now let's take the concept called affirmative action, which I submit is the best concept this country has ever had to become competitive. Now what do I mean by affirmative action? First of all, I don't mean the affirmative action that you're used to. Affirmative action, ladies and gentlemen, in its classic sense works like this. The National Basketball League has a, uh, a voting for the, at, at the end of the season for the best new players. Now which team in the league is allowed to select the best new player? The worst team. Why do we let the worst team in the league select the best new player? Because if the worst team in the league is improved, the overall competitiveness of the league is improved, is it not? In other words, if you put this nine foot six guy on a team, he makes 465 points a game, and you put him on a team with nobody but a bunch of midgets like myself, you know they're gonna win some games. Therefore, the top team and the worst team will have a triple overtime on it just before you finish your Budweiser. Uh, time to go to the fridge. You can't leave because it's triple overtime. You love it. So more of us watch it. The more spectators who watch, the more television revenue, the more television revenue, the more income for the owners, the more the owners make, the more they pay the players, and it's win-win. <laughs> spectators, owners, players, everybody wins. That's when affirmative action works. It works when you support the worst team in the league. Now, what is the worst team in the league in America? The disadvantaged and the poor. If we develop policies aimed at rehabilitating the worst in the league, the disadvantaged and the poor, I do not mean welfare programs to perpetuate generations of dependency. That is not what I'm talking about. I am talking about programs that will help people rehabilitate themselves and be potentially constructive citizens. 
That's what I mean when I say help disadvantaged people. And ladies and gentlemen, if we did that, we would strengthen the worst team in the league and we should do it based on need. If you are polka dot and you cannot read or write, we must find a way to teach you to become, el to become literate. If you are polka dot and you have no education and no opportunities, we must find ways to offer you opportunities and to motivate you. And if everybody standing in that help me line is black, no one in America would object. But no group is going to have, 10, 12% of the population is going to have any program to help people that is exclusively for their group. That is just politically not viable. And the moment you do that, you turn the, the opinion against you, which works its way up, public opinion works its way up through our congressional, through our legislator and our executive uh, offices, and you see what you see right now. You see the rebellion on the part of the white middle class, which is why the Democratic Party is offering the Democratic voters two Republicans for president. <laughs> Nobody with a Democratic agenda can be nominated any longer in the Democratic Party. The only true Democrat running on the Democratic side is Tom Harkin, and he can't get two votes. <laughs> the candidates who are getting the votes in the Democratic primary are Clinton and Sanders, both of which have adopted a Republican platform. Sanders is even at odds with his own congressional leadership. He said what they're doing with this middle class so-called tax break is, I quote him, immoral. For them to come along and Sanders just, I mean, uh, Clinton, just pandering to middle class whites with the so-called tax break with which you can buy one candy bar a day is not going to solve America's economic problems. <laughs> Sanders is the closest thing, including George Bush, to telling the American people what they really have to do. And he's pulling up short because he's now the front runner and he won't give pain back anymore. He's now giving more and more excuses. So through our own political process, we are forcing the people who could tell us the truth to be afraid to do it. Now here you have in this country this political malaise, ladies and gentlemen. And we're going to get more of the same unless you and I change. I don't have any faith in anybody in Congress changing. None. If you and I don't change, there is no hope in this country. If you and I do not make sure that these people call Congress uh, who have spent $3 trillion in the last 20 years they didn't have, not what they spent, $3 trillion more than they had. They, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know what $3 trillion is, $1 trillion seconds ago was 29,697 years ago, the Stone Age. These guys down here have spent $3 trillion in 20 years. And your children and your children's children are going to pay for it with a reduction in standard of living, which you already see. Your middle class friends are becoming poor and your poor friends are becoming homeless. And as you buy your Toyotas, you cannot go to a job at General Motors. And as you buy your Toyotas, you transfer the dividends to the people who own the companies. You create the upper scale jobs for engineers and designers in Tokyo and you simply provide cheap labor. And any country in the world which is known for cheap labor is a third, a third rate and a third world country. That's what we're becoming, exporting uh, unfinished goods and importing manufactured finished goods. We don't make one uh, tennis shoe in this country. We don't make one television. And the only American company left that manufactures televisions, um, Motorola, makes them in Mexico. We are exporting our industry. We are exporting our wealth because we don't have a vision of what we want to do. And the, and the answer to this is not to build a wall around this country. The answer to this is to take the Japanese on one-on-one. -on -one. The answer to this, I saw this wonderful man uh, upstate in New England on CNN yesterday, a real nice white man who's really upset that the Japanese said we're lazy and we don't work as hard as they do. And he works construction. They showed pictures of him working hard and all of these workers real sweating. They really work hard physically. And this man invited any Japanese over and, and defied them to work as hard as any American on his crew. You know what the poor man is missing? You don't work hard because you work longer. The Japanese work smarter because the Japanese have a $500 screwdriver and the Americans have a 35 cent screwdriver. And you just can't make as good a products with a 35 cent screwdriver as you do a $500 screwdriver. This is what he's missing. Sure, they carry more board, they carry more iron, and they sweat more than the Japanese. But they're not more effective than the Japanese. 
because we've not reinvested in research and development and we've not reinvested in manufacturing. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, we can be good people, well-meaning people, patriotic people, but unless we have a leadership that has given us an industrial policy that defines short and long-range goals and allocates resources to meeting these short and long-range goals, we cannot be a competitive nation. But that has to come back to us, and it has to come back to if, whether or not we are willing to practice affirmative action. And when I say affirmative action, I'm not talking about giving someone something for nothing, and I'm not talking about hiring people who are unqualified. I'm talking about taking your labor share, which is the only resource you have, and using it effectively. In eight years in America, over 50% of the workforce will be female and non-white. That is a statistical fact. Only 15% of people entering the workforce between 1986 and year 2000 will be white males because of a low birth rate. What is this country going to do? Turning its back on potentially the only source of labor and uh, industrial competition we have. We will not be competitive. This is not, you don't have to like women. You don't have to like Hispanics. You don't have to like blacks. <coughs> But they are going to be the people who are going to determine the future of you, your family, your city, and your country, and your, most important of all, your children. And you've got to do something to help them help themselves, or you can't help yourself. There can be no victors. There can be no Pat Buchanan's winning, ladies and gentlemen. Now, some of you are convinced that he simply is trying to send a message to Bush, and that's what he wants you to do. Do you know Hitler asked the citizens of Germany to send a message to the Kaiser? That's how he got in power. I'm not comparing Buchanan to Hitler. I'm simply saying he's using the same tactic. And the tactic is, you help me because you don't like him. I'll tell you this, if you want to send a message uh, to uh, anybody, you should send a message to Buchanan by voting for Bush. That'll send a message to him. That'll tell him what you think about the future of this country. Sure, George Bush has a lot of problems, but right now he looks bad because he's running against God. But when it's all settled, he'll run against somebody like a Clinton or a Saunders and he'll begin to look very good. You destroy him in the process and you destroy your own potential because there is nothing else. There is no one else. And ladies and gentlemen, I am glad that I will be able to tell my grandchildren and their children that when this day came, I stood up for what was right. I am glad that I will be able to say, if I am wrong, I will admit I am wrong. But if I'm right, you'll never hear the last of it. <laughs> because, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to have to change, and you, particularly those of you who are white, are going to have to resist the temptation for someone to, put, to play to the baser side of your instincts and to convince you that the only problem you have is black people. I am not making a case for integration. As a matter of fact, I am not an integrationist. I believe in equality. I do not believe that any race is better than I. Therefore, I don't believe I need to be bused to another neighborhood to learn to read and write and count. As a matter of fact, I think busing is stupid. It's stupid because only 16% of white people finish college. 46% of Asian Americans finish college. So if you want to bust Tony Brown, you bust me to Chinatown. <laughs> people and black people are basically the same. We have a, both of us have a, 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 a few geniuses. Uh, most of us are average. We have a few geniuses and a liberal sprinkling of fools. <laughs> and anywhere you find human beings, you will find the same distribution. And I think in the black community, we pay too much attention to white people. All we do, we discuss whites. We get up in the morning talking about them, talk about them during lunch, during sex, before we go to bed. White people don't discuss us. White people go to school, have a nice day, put your money in the bank, talk about health care and insurance, all kinds of things. They don't discuss us. All blacks are talking about is white people. And I say to black people, I beg you, I implore of you, let white people go. <laughs> Wish them a nice day and a wonderful life. Take your energy and build up your own neighborhoods. Make your school so good, someone else will be in court suing you to go to school with your people. Make your family strong. Tell these fools to stop killing each other in the name of the That'll make us better and it'll make the country better. It's win-win. You can't demand that I respect you if you don't respect yourself. You can't demand that I spend money with you when you won't spend money with your own people. The most effective economic boycott in America is the boycott that black people conduct against their own people in business. 
We spend only 6.6% of our income with a black business or a black professional. We earn every year, this year we will earn $300 billion, equal to the gross national product of Canada or Australia, and equal to the gross national pro product of the 13th richest nation in the world. Our problem is not income, and the biggest lie ever told is the black community is poor. We are not a poor community. We are a community that uses its resources poorly. If we were to intelligently use our resources to reinvest in our own institutions, we would be not only the richest, one of the richest, we would be the richest community in this country, and as a result of improving and increasing our family income, we would increase our SAT scores, we would improve our health, everything that's wrong with us would be improved because all of these are simply indexed to the standard of living or the family income. All you got to do to improve every aspect of any group's life is to simply improve the, 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 the level of income of the family unit. And we pay no or little attention to that. All we're talking about in the black community is being bust or being the first Negro over here or what someone is going to give us. We don't pay attention to empowerment. And someone said last night, a white friend of mine, that someone white told him that when blacks talk about empowerment, they're talking about getting back at whites. Can you imagine living in America without wanting America to be powerful? Now, does that mean because you want to live in a powerful country, you hate people from other countries? That is really stupid. Anybody who doesn't want to be, have power is abnormal, because without power, you cannot be equal. If you do not use your resources to empower yourselves, you cannot have equality, because everybody else that is doing anything worthwhile has some form of power, particularly power as a group. We're not talking about taking the country apart. We're talking about putting the country together, and we're talking about everybody in the country making a contribution to the country. Not one group being better than another group, but every group standing on its own, which is why so many of us admire so greatly the Asian uh, American groups. They are self-sufficient. We like that. The Asians who are self-sufficient don't have an anti-white movement. They simply want to be self-sufficient so they can be productive citizens. And wouldn't it not be wonderful if we could say the same about black people in this country? That they're self-sufficient and they take care of themselves, therefore they contribute more? That's not getting back at anybody, that's making it all better. We would all be relieved of a lot of tensions that we have now. The bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, is we need a vision and we need to see where we're going to fit in in this country in this vision. And we're going to have to deal with one another. And as I said, we're going to have to compete and we're going to have to change and we're going to have to sacrifice. We're going to have to understand, and there's another misnomer, in terms of blacks wanting to have pride in who they are. There are those who are convinced, unfortunately, that there is some PC going on, politically correct. And every time a black person says, well, we want to tell you about Benjamin Banneker or Martin Luther King, there's someone who says, oh, they simply want us to believe that everybody black did something right. Then on the other side, you have the black fools who are saying that nobody did anything correct other than people who were black. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there is a history, and it is a human history, and I will apologize in advance for saying or saying before all of us that we are all human beings, because I know all of us in America have learned all of our lives to invest all of our psychic energy in all of these races we have created and made up, but you can make up all the races you want. There is a human race. As a matter of fact, you can paint wings on a pig, but if you throw him off of a building, he still can't fly. <laughs> You can do what you want. We're human beings. We look different, and we look different for some very obvious and understandable reasons, because our ancestors came from different parts of the world. And if you come from a place called Norway or the northern part of Europe, the ultraviolet rays of the sun are very weak. Therefore, the skin does not need melanin. The skin, therefore, is so-called white. And if you live in that part of the world over long periods of time, thousands, hundreds of years, you will develop long and narrow nostrils because the air is dry and cold. If you take that physical type, it's called phenotype adaptation, or the adaptation of the physical body to the human elements, if you take that same type to the Sudan in 120 degree a day heat, over X hundreds of thousands of years, that same human being will become so-called brown or black because they will need melanin to protect them from the ultraviolet rays of the sun. The nostrils will become wide to breathe the thick air, and the hair will become good. Like mom. <laughs> that, is, that is simple physical or phenotype adaptation. The dumbest concept in the world is that one group is superior and or inferior because of the presence or absence of melanin in the skin. God made your hair as curly, kinky, or straight as he chose. He placed your eyes the exact number of centimeters on either side of his nose or your nose. 
He made your nostrils wide for breathing and your lips thick for kissing. You are perfect in every conceivable way. When you look into the mirror, you look into the face of perfection. When you look into the mirror, you look into the face of God. If you have the love and the beauty and the self-esteem within to see God when he or she looks back at you. If you do not have this sense of self-esteem, you're going to need some scapegoats. And that's a neurotic pattern because one problem will simply create another problem. And you still won't find yourself and you certainly won't get what you want. If you look in the mirror and find someone that you feel intrinsically can't compete with someone else because you believe the lies of involved in the black community for the last 30 years called integration has simply exacerbated an already existing problem. We've simply alienated people because we were confused about what we wanted. We didn't know whether we wanted to be equal or whether we wanted to be with them. And those who believed we wanted to be with them won out. So we drove everybody crazy trying to be with them, so therefore we never became equal, therefore they didn't want to be with us. The bottom line is, if you ever want to have an equal or a society of equality, you're going to have to have a society of equal contributors. We don't have to uh, agree on everything. That's not the point. But we have to agree on something. And we have to agree on something essential. We're at a crossroads. Wes Mender and I were talking about it last night. We're at a crossroads, ladies and gentlemen. And the Republican Party, we are going to define the Republican Party as a party of American apartheid, or we're going to redefine the Republican Party as what it is and why it was organized. The Republican Party was founded on May 9, 1854 in Ripon, Wisconsin, to stop the westward advancement of slavery. The Republican Party gave the slaves their freedom, the right to vote, and citizenship. The Republican Party championed the rights of black people in this country up to the 30s. And between 36, 33 roughly, and 64, when uh, Roosevelt came in with the, uh, uh, the New Deal and so forth, uh, blacks then became, be, uh, began to drift to the Democratic Party. Prior to that, we've been 100% Republicans. Then between 36 and 66, 34 and 66 roughly, we became 35% Republican, 65% Democrat. With Lyndon Johnson in 66, Voting Rights Act, Civil Rights Bills, then blacks became 100% Democrat. Now the two periods in history in which blacks have not gotten anything out of the political process was the first period and the third period. The first period was when we made the mistake of being 100% Republicans, and the third and present state in which we have made the mistake of being almost 100% Democrats. You can't sell what you give away. Between 35, 36, and 66, when we voted 35% Republican and 65% Democrat, we were paid off handsomely by both parties because we were smart enough to be the swing vote. Who elects the black mayor of Atlanta? 65% black city. Who elects the black mayor of Washington, D.C.? 75% black uh, city. The blacks, are, aren't they going to divide between two black candidates? And then if the white minority, numerical minority vote steps in, do they not pick the winner? What would happen on a national basis if blacks follow my advice? I've developed a concept I call the 35-65 solution. Now, I joined the Republican Party, and blacks say to me, why did you join the Republican Party? And I say, before I answer your question, let me tell you why you are a Democrat. I can look at my black friends and know why they're Democrats, because things are going so well for them. <laughs> Employment is so high. They have so much money. The schools are so good. The families are so stable. I know why they go back every year and vote for the Democrats. They like the way things are. They must like the way things are, or they wouldn't keep voting for the Democrats. How can anybody believe that you can give one party all of your vote, be 12% of the total, and then have some say in the outcome? That means that blacks would then have political power. It also means that the Democratic Party would have to do something to get some of those blacks back in order to be viable. Then we would have a two-party system, and then we would have an empowered black community that would empower itself by virtue of its own vote. But so long as blacks stand on the outside and say, Tony, how could you join a party of, of racists? I said, how could you stay in a party of racists? <laughs> and nobody white who's a Republican got a genetic infusion of racism because they were Republicans. And nobody, a Democrat who is white, becomes some wonderful person because they pull a lever on a, on, on a voting booth. Racism is in both parties. When they said we could not go on the front door of buildings, when they said we could not uh, go to and live in the neighborhood of our choice, we didn't roll over and play dead. We changed this system. We fought against segregation. And we won. Why is it that we sit back now in the black community and allow the Republican Party to become an all-white party in a multicultural society? And then what happens is you naturally are going to gravitate toward the David Dukes 
and the, and the Pat Buchanan's, and you're going to convince yourself that you're talking about conservatism, and you're not. Pat Buchanan is as much of a conservative as I am, and I am not a conservative, and I admit it. And most of the white conservatives I know tell me Pat Buchanan isn't a conservative either. He's a demagogue, and he's bringing out the worst side of the white population in this country, and he will destroy the Republican Party if he succeeds. There will never be a movement that will succeed in this country based on the disenfranchisement of another group. It cannot succeed. The only movement that will work will be for the Republican Party to be what it was founded to be, the party of individual rights, opportunity, and government that does not interfere with the rights of the population and that does not rob us blind in the process. That's the only way we're going to have a viable country. And so therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I submit that we are at a crossroads. By defining policies or policies in a way that can bring us together without some you've got to live in my house and I've got to marry your daughter and we've got to have 1.6 blacks and 3.8 whites and 16 point Asians and all that other crazy nonsense. We can come up with issues that will help the country and help every political group in it. And let me suggest a couple of them. Black community is very concerned and I'm sure everybody in America is very concerned that there are more black men in prison than in college. And you do know it costs more money to incarcerate someone than it costs to put them through college. So if that is a fact, and we're all very disturbed about that fact, why do we not pass legislation or develop policies that will make it mandatory that no one can be released from prison or jail unless they have learned to read and write? Why do we not give a preference for people who come before parole boards? Like the old veterans preference. You gave a veteran 10 points buying a house, 10 points on going to school, whatever it is. Why don't we give anybody who is in prison a, a preference when they go before the parole board if they have learned to read and write? Now, the ACLU won't like the idea because it makes too much sense. So they will start talking about the rights of prisoners and they will block it. So to keep them from blocking it, make it just give preferences. Say, okay, this guy's learned to read and write, therefore he's got 10 points before the parole board. Why don't we do that? Why don't we turn these prisons into schools? Since we've got them locked up there for 10, 20 years, 30 years, they'll come out PhDs, they will come out and invent things that the Japanese would never think of. You'd be amazed what kind of brains you got. Now let me say this one thing. A lot of people think black people aren't smart because they don't have high IQs. But let me tell you this. You ever watch this 14-year-old guy out on the corner selling dope, this young black man from the projects? You ever watch him? Do you know he's got 50 or 100 customers in his head? He doesn't write anything down. He knows what kind of poison they buy. He knows how much it costs per gram. He can compute in his head 16 grams times 4.6 centimeters. I don't even understand it. He couldn't be, uh, couldn't be dumb. Here's a guy who comes on the stage and a rap artist. He memorizes 19 volumes in a song. <laughs> and he wouldn't know Shakespeare if he caught himself in bed with him. Now, there's no way in the world you can say the guy does not have a high IQ. You can make the case that he's, he's wasting his life and doing the wrong thing, but you cannot say that he is not smart. These guys in jail are brilliant. You know what some of them have done? They've done some stupid stuff. But if you could rechannel that energy, and help them, they're there. Make them learn. Give them an incentive to be productive. What are we going to do spending more money, $25,000, $50,000 a year, keeping somebody locked up for 10 years? They come out, they, they're worse than they were 10 years before, and before they get home, they knock somebody in the head to do something crazy. That's one suggestion. One, that is we could make literacy mandatory for people in prison. The second thing is we've got schools in this country. You ever heard of the, of the, of the I talked yesterday with William Bennett. You ever heard of the uh, concept of education or the structure of education they have in Germany? It's called Hochschule. Hoch means high, Schule means school. In the seventh grade in Germany, you take an exam. Most of you go into a track that is trade oriented. So by the time you're 18, everybody in that track is fully employable because you are an electronics engineer, you are a printer, you're a carpenter, you have a useful trade. The others who are academically oriented go into college prep. Therefore, at 17, everyone is employed or everyone goes to college. That's the secret of education in Germany. Of course, the Germans and the Japanese go to school more days than we do. And you do, if you don't know, uh, should understand that the Japanese have one half the computers that American students have. So it is not a matter of who has the most computers. It's a matter of who has the concept and the values that tell them that they are going to do something about education, which is really the only way you can succeed in this country. So why do we not adopt, adapt a system of education that allows people uh, to uh, 
uh, to go into something that could make them useful. Someone said to me, but Tony, uh, in America they wouldn't stand for that because it sounds elitist and it seems as though you're taking someone and say, well, you're not good enough to be a doctor, we want you to be a printer. So what happens if a guy at 12 becomes a printer and at 17 he becomes fully employed? What happens between 12 and 17? He gets work habits, doesn't he? You know the values we talk about? Where do you think you get values? You don't get values in seminars. You get values through your work experience. You get values through your life. You gotta be somewhere every morning at eight o'clock. And you gotta get along with people from eight to five. You gotta go to lunch at 12 and be back by one. You gotta produce and you gotta have someone who supervises you. You gotta learn to get along with other people. This is what makes a person worth something. So this would happen, and at 18, if the guy was a printer, he had a good job making a lot of money, he could always go back to school and become a physicist or an MD or whatever else he wanted to become. And then uh, we're talking about fair, fairness in taxation, are we not? Ladies and gentlemen, there's no way in the world you're going to make a system fair when you play politics with the tax system, like they're doing now, the Democrats in particular, in which you're going to give everybody a candy bar a day to make them happy and get their vote. That is not going to be fair. And you're not going to have a system in which those people who produce the most are punished because they produce the most. Then you have a disincentive for production. So what do you do? You make it fair, don't you? And you take the fairness issue from the Democrats. How do you do that? You make taxes voluntary. How do you make taxes voluntary? You have value. You, you have a value-added tax, a national sales tax, let's say of 13 or 14 percent. And every time you buy something, we add 13 or 14 percent to the purchase. If you don't buy anything, you don't pay any taxes. Now let's say that you make $50,000 a year and you spend $50,000 a year. The government will get 13 percent of the $50,000 a year. We don't need any IRS to collect it. We can fire all those bums. We can put the whole thing out of business. We get rid of that whole bureaucracy. Right? Your taxes are paid on, right on point of purchase, and in, you know the Underground Railroad, don't you? All the drug dealers and the prostitutes and all the illegal activity, you know they don't pay any taxes. Well, they would have to pay taxes every time they bought a Cadillac or a yacht or a big house, wouldn't they? Now, do you know that we honest citizens, for every one dollar the Underground people don't pay in taxes, do you know we honest people steal nine dollars for every one they don't pay? You know, the biggest problem in this country now, and the IRS would never admit it, is they cannot collect taxes from honest taxpayers. And if we had a, vo if we had a voluntary tax system, they would, everybody would pay taxes immediately. Now, what would happen to poor people, you're saying? We would make the tax re progressive. Therefore, any family of four earning under $10,000 would get a 100% rebate for every penny they paid in taxes. Now, let's say you make $50,000 and uh, you... Um, don't buy anything, which would be impossible, but let's hypothetically say you put the $50,000 in the bank. What would we do with your $50,000? We would use it for research and development, would we not? Why can we not get out of this recession? Because there's no capital. Every recession is always solved with an infusion of capital, but the institutions that have capital now don't have capital. So if we have, ladies and gentlemen, a forced savings, which is voluntary, then we would have enough savings to drive our manufacturing uh, system to create jobs and rehabilitate this society. If you took the 13% value added tax and added a $1 gasoline tax, and we're going to have to wake up back to sacrifice and change now. We're not an oil producing uh, a country. We are net importing oil uh, uh, country. Therefore, we cannot have the luxury of driving around at a dollar a gallon gas. It can't happen. We do not want to invest in any alternate energy. So we simply wait for, for the Arabs every three or four years to put the screws to us. They're turning it now. As soon as this election is over, they got a surprise for you in 1993. They're just waiting for this election. So if you pay an extra dollar a gallon for gasoline and you have a 13% voluntary value-added tax, and it's easy to compute because that's simply the difference between the goods and services, or, or the, rather the raw materials, and your sales price. There's no, no way to cheat. So if we did that, in 1984, instead of having a deficit of 160, I think, billion dollars, we would have had a net uh, surplus of about 120 billion with the same revenues, and everybody would have been happy. You would have paid taxes on demand. Ladies and gentlemen, if I may make an analogy, on December the 1st, 1954, 
A woman named Rosa Parks would not surrender her seat to a white man on a segregated bus in Montgomery, Alabama. When Rosa Parks sat down, we stood up all over America with a new sense of consciousness. And what did we learn on December the 1st, 1955? We learned that there had been plenty of room in the front of the bus all along. All we ever had to do was to get up and move. I'd like now to take you to an island off of Japan, inhabited exclusively by hundreds of thousands of monkeys. At one time, not one monkey on this island had ever washed his or her food before they ate it. One morning, a monkey washed her food. It tasted better. Another monkey saw her. Two monkeys. You know, monkey see, monkey do. The number four monkeys, 16 monkeys, exponentially it grew to 99 monkeys. When the 100th monkey washed his food, simultaneously, every monkey on that island washed his or her food before they ate it. Because when the 100th monkey was reached, a critical mass of consciousness was reached in the monkey population. Rosa Parks, on December the 1st, 1955, expressed symbolically the elevation in the consciousness of black people in America. That we would no longer go in back doors, we would no longer be offended, that we have demanded our constitutional guarantees. And all of these civil rights bills simply reflected the change that took place internally within black people in America. Now, since 1955, we have been fighting the so-called civil rights war, which we have won. We now have more rights than we're taking advantage of. Therefore, what we need now in the black community and in America is a new sense of consciousness. We need a new 100 monkeys. We need Americans, ladies and gentlemen, who are willing to sacrifice and Americans who are willing to change so we can elevate our consciousness to the next level. Nature has stagnated us. It has stagnated us, ladies and gentlemen, because we have grown to a point where we didn't want to grow any further. And bad times forces you to grow because it forces you to deal with your problems. There's something much more important than all this race nonsense we talk. All this liberal, conservative, Republican, Democrat, rich and poor. Ladies and gentlemen, we are children of God. And we will answer to a God and to a higher order. It is not important the way you treat me. It's important the way I treat you. Because if I love you, I grow. No matter what you do to me, if you hate me, you will not grow. And we did not come here to eat sandwiches or get uh, trophies or to win political races. We came here to be decent human beings. And that transcends, ladies and gentlemen, all of the petty nonsense that we're caught up in. And I ask us to grow beyond it. It is not easy coming out of an America in which all you've ever learned is that the other guy was taking something from you and you always had to build a wall around yourself to make sure he or she didn't get it. That bunker mentality, ladies and gentlemen, is no longer going to work. We are all going to have to admit some sense of responsibility. Black people are going to have to make affirmative action, a, a policy that all Americans can benefit from. White Americans are going to have to understand that if they do not invest in the most disadvantaged in this country, they will hurt the most advantaged in this country because we all share time and space. I'd finally like to say this about poor people in terms of policy. Now, I know some of us have come to the point out of reaction over the years of programs for poor people and blacks and Hispanics in particular in which we've become reactionary toward those programs. But let me say this. I was in church when I was a little boy and I remember the preacher telling us about Jesus and he said, Jesus said, the poor will always be with us and it bothered me because Jesus is my main man. And I couldn't understand Jesus being cavalier about poverty. I said, why would Jesus say that people are gonna be poor? Well, Jesus said that people are gonna be poor not because he was cavalier, but because he had such great wisdom that he knew the nature of human beings. And he knew that those of us who got it wouldn't help those of us who didn't get it. And he knew, therefore, that poverty was man-made, and as long as you had human beings, we would always create poverty. Now, how do we create poverty? You create poverty by denying someone who is impoverished of wealth. Now, what is wealth? Wealth comes in three forms. First form of wealth is financial wealth. That's your money in the bank. Your second form of wealth is your social capital. That's your sophistication. You're going for a job interview, you're there 15 minutes early, you clean your nails, you wear your best suit or your dress, you're polite, you put forward your best standard English, etc. That's your sophistication, which is your ability to assimilate in this society, which you've got primarily informally from your family and your environment through intergenerational transfer. Now, the third form of wealth and the most important form of wealth is human capital. Our human capital is the total education society has invested in us and our experience on the job. 
our information. Now, if you take our information, education and experience on the job, and you put it together with our sophistication, which is our assimilation, assimilative ability, you will ultimately have to get, will you not, wealth in a financial form? If you own a business and you go bankrupt, if you have sufficient social and human capital, you can then regain another financial uh, a, a form of wealth, can you not? But if you don't have social and human capital, then you have absolutely no chance of ever becoming wealthy again because you don't have those things that possess it. What happened in the black community? Why do you think today, for an example, that we have in the black community, uh, you know, I'll talk about the worst team and the best team. People like me in the black community represent the best team. I don't need affirmative action. I don't need any government help. I never have and I never shall. And everybody I know like me doesn't need it either. But in our community, there are people who do need it. And in every community, there are people who need it for various reasons. And those are the people we should help. So when you look very carefully at how you get to be poor in the black community, when we say we want to help the black community, too often we say we want to help the best team in the league, the black middle class. Blacks who earn over $50,000 are earning, uh, uh, blacks who earn over $50,000 are earn, growing at a faster rate than whites who earn over $50,000. It is not true that all of us are poor. It is true that some of us are poor. So if we were to direct the programs, not at the group that's the best team in the league, but at the poor blacks, would we not overall strengthen our league and would the black community not be a stronger community? So who can do that? No one can do that but the black middle class because the black middle class is the only group that can transfer intergenerationally social and human capital to the poor blacks. The poor blacks are cut off, first of all, class-wise from everyone else and they're cut off from most or all of white Americans. So the only community that can transfer these values is the black middle class. So as long as the black middle class believes that affirmative action programs are programs to help rich blacks get their sons and daughters in Harvard and Vassar, or affirmative action are programs to put their friends in business, then the overall league will remain weak, will it not? So those of us in the black community who truly believe in affirmative action should want to practice it in our own community. And all Americans should want to practice it based on need. To the extent to which we teach someone to read and write is the extent to which we make someone wealthy and productive either now or, or in the near future. I'd like to thank you for listening to me today, and I'd like to conclude by really congratulating the uh, Georgia Public Policy Foundation. As you know, it's a new entity, and it is carving out a new place for itself. And I think this is something that is very needed. I think the dialogue is what we need. It is not a matter of any of us being right. It's simply a matter of us dialoguing with one another. All of us will hear something that the other man or woman says that we can use. That makes us better people. If we don't talk, if we don't discuss these things, we become enemies. Inadvertently, perhaps, but we become enemies. And it's important that foundations and think tanks like this bring us together to share these ideas. Because as we plant these seeds, the flowers will ultimately grow. I'd like to leave you with a challenge as you go about your meetings later today. And this challenge comes from a poem called Flanders Field. And Flanders Field is a graveyard in France in which many of the American dead from World War I are buried. And the poem was written to remind those Americans who came back from that great war of the tremendous sacrifice that those dead men made. And it goes like this. To you from failing hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies blow in Flanders Field. God bless you.